USCHO.com. This is the USCHO Game of the Week podcast from U.S. College Hockey Online at USCHO.com. An in-depth look at this week's top college hockey matchup and a preview of the other big games. Welcome to USCHO's Game of the Week podcast for Thursday, October 14th, 2021. I'm Ed Trefsker alongside Jim Connolly. Jim, we've got some premier matchups this weekend happening in Duluth at the Icebreaker with four teams who could all be in the Frozen Four come April. The Icebreaker Tournament Part 2 takes place out in Duluth, Minnesota this weekend. And what a field they have. The host, Minnesota Duluth, takes on Michigan. Minnesota State takes on Providence. That is two unbelievable matchups. We're joined by the head coach of Minnesota Duluth. That's Scott Sandlin. Scott, I, I know that these things get scheduled a ways out, but maybe you can dream that you'd have you know four top 10 teams in one tournament, but this is a killer field for, for a tournament two weeks, three weeks into the season. Yeah, for sure. Like, you know, we're, we're, we're just fortunate, like obviously it got canceled last year to, to get all the, all the teams to commit to coming back. So uh, I think uh, when you look at it, we're, uh, where teams are at early in the year here, it sets up for an unbelievable weekend of hockey. As a coach, do you like being in these situations where you're in a two game tournament, you know, winners advance. I've heard some coaches talk about this as like simulating an NCAA regional simulating, you know, your conference tournament later in the year. Is this a benefit to, to get teams to go through different game times and different situations? Yeah, I think, I think so. I think anytime you're, you're in those situations, it helps uh, because again, hopefully at the end of the year, you're, you're in that similar situation. Um, So uh, I, I think it's uh, it's a little different from obviously the normal two game, same opponent, but we got enough of that. So it, it is a nice change. And I think uh, obviously when you see the, the field, uh, you might be seeing some of the teams that are, you know, could be in the tournament at the end of the year as well. Speaking of two games, same opponent, Bemidji State last weekend. Uh, what did you take away from your team's performance against the Beavers? Well, I think the most important thing is we got the wins. Like I think Friday night, uh, Again, always, always a tough place. It's been a very tough place for us to, to win. I, I know our record against Bemidji, too, since we joined the league has not been very good. I think we've only had one win. So credit to Tom's teams, which we knew, uh, you know, again, they're, they're a strong team. They're going to be one of the top teams in, in the CCHA. And uh, we had a really good game. Uh, it was up and down, and we traded leads the Friday night. And, you know, I thought our guys just, just played uh, composed uh, again, which I was really pleased with. And, and we held, we held the lead going on the third and, and, and managed to close that game out. So uh, Saturday was a little bit different. I thought uh, they were a little bit, a little bit more of a, they had more energy. I thought they were a little bit crisper early and uh, it was, it was a tight game, which, which we expected. And uh, the shots were very minimal, uh, but we had a good third period and, you know, again, it was one, one and we got a big goal from our freshmen, but I thought I liked how we, we played in the tight games. I, I thought, uh, you know, there was a lot of good things uh, just with, within our team. Certainly a lot of things we need to get better at. But uh, I just like our composure and I liked how we stayed with the games and I liked how we were able to, to win tight games uh, early in the year. I look at your roster up and down, some familiar names, uh, but some new names, definitely. What has it been like managing this team, trying to get some new guys and some some guys that have been in your program for a while to, to gel together. Yeah, it's been a little bit different. I mean, it's nice getting, it's nice getting those, those guys back, uh, you know, the Kobe Ross, the Kobe Benders, uh, obviously getting Noah back, uh, you know, certainly those, you know, those are key guys for us, but you know, when you look at, I look at some teams across the country whether it's Bemidji, I look at St. Cloud, you know, certainly like a St. Cloud didn't lose much at all. And a lot of their lines uh, for the most part are, are almost starting the year as intact like they did last year. And, you know, with what we lost with, with Sweeney and Jackson Cates and Cole Kepke, we lost, you know, some, some key pieces off our top line. So, um, you know, we're trying to find a little bit of that chemistry uh, with some new line combinations uh, that maybe we haven't seen. Um, so there's, uh, there's that getting used to uh, guys, you know, trying to, my big thing is trying to find two thirds of a line and, and, and plug it in a third guy. But uh you know, we, we moved a lot of guys around even in the month of September. So I think just finding that right chemistry, I think it's still a work in progress. And I think our back end is a little bit more stable because I think our top four with Kaiser and, and, and Louis Rail and Maddie Anderson and Connor Kelly all kind of finished the year playing together. So 
And then kind of the same thing with our goaltending. It's a little clearer picture than it was last year, um, having seen those guys go through a year and, and play. So um, we feel a little bit better, you know, about that part of it. But the forward group, uh, you know, has been, you know, a little bit of a mix and match. And, and some of our freshmen have come in and, you know, uh, whether it's Dom James or Carter Loney, uh, those two guys are playing in the middle of the rink as young players. So it's, it's a learning curve for them, but we've got some older guys with them. Speaking of the older guys, Scott, you've got, uh, if I counted right, four fifth-year players, including Kobe Roth, who you mentioned. What has been the impact of having these guys back for an extra year, uh, just in general, in, in finding line combinations and finding roster spots? How's that impacted you? It's it's certainly nice when you can plug in guys, veteran guys, right? And, uh, you know, those guys, you know, were key components of our team and uh, last year and, and obviously the previous years, you know, and to be able to to have that experience, you know, on those lines, or maybe if you have to throw them with a younger player, you know, they can provide that, that leadership. And I think that's a big thing that those guys are, are providing our team right now is that leadership and experience and, and things that they've gone through. And, you know, they were really, they were really good last year too, as seniors, um, especially a guy like Kobe Roth, just a real calm demeanor. And I think it was great in the room and, He's kind of translated that into this year. He's wearing a letter this year that he didn't last year. So uh, the leadership part, the experience part, and just the demeanor they play the game with, uh, you know, is, is really important for the young guys to, to see and, and for our team to see. You mentioned this series with Bemidji, home and home. You got to experience fans in the building for the first time in a couple of years. I know last year, a lot of people were talking about, yeah, you know, once we get on the ice, we play the game. But I, I just have to know that it, it, impacted you just to feel the energy yeah a lot better than the cardboard cutouts <laughs> uh, no it was, it was awesome uh, you know i think our guys really you know i think both teams obviously look forward to having you know you know their fans and, and, and family and students and everything in the, in the stands and we had a good you know good atmosphere in bemidji and uh, it was nice that we could kind of keep them a little quiet because we kept you know holding the lead but uh, it was great when we walked out uh, for a warm-up our student section had about 1,200 students in it. They were loud. Uh, obviously, the building filled in. I think we ended up with about just under 6,000 people. So um, it was it was awesome. I know the guys were really looking forward to, to having the opportunity to play again in, in our building with with our fans and, and feeding off the, you know that energy that the, they provide. So um, it, it's great, and hopefully we can continue to to do that because uh, it's something that they did miss out on last year. Scott, we mentioned off the top. This weekend's icebreaker, number one, Minnesota State. They'll play number 10, Providence. But your team's going to take on Michigan, number three in the country right now, a team that is laden with number one draft picks, first-round draft picks, number one overall draft picks. Um, I've watched their power play on video, which probably would scare most coaches to even, <laughs> even want to get out there. <laughs> even want to get out there. Um, you know, I don't even know how, how to – even ask the question, but what do you do against a team like Michigan? How do you, how do you slow elite speed and skill down? Well, I think number one, we can't get, you know, uh, so enamored by that, right? Well, you know, I think that's one thing I think our teams in the past, you know, we've tried to, I know it's a cliche, but you really try and focus on your game and, and trying to play your best game. And, you know, I think against them, obviously they they've got the skill, um, you know, they, they play so well off each other. Um, you know, because they're, they're just intelligent players. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, managing pucks and, 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 you know, just, just playing a smart game. Um, obviously we know they, I know how Michigan teams have always played in the past. They play with great pace. Uh, it's always, it's always been fun to play them because they like to get up and down the rink and, um, you know, we do too. And, uh, they, they might have a little more, you know, of the skill guys, but uh, at the same time, I just think you really, we just need to really kind of focus on some of the things that we need to do. I mean, obviously the, you know, the big number one thing is staying out of the box. I mean, you know, it seems like I say that a lot against teams in our league too, but it, it, it's a special power play. Um, you know, I can go back to 11 when we had a similar power play uh, with Conley's and Fontaine and Falk and, you know, they just kind of, you know, you set the foundation, but they play, they, they played hockey off it. And, and, and it's a special group, right. It, it, you know, it, they don't come along very often and they're very dangerous. And so we've got to make sure we're, you know, number one discipline and not taking a, a lot of penalties. And 
that's easier said than done because of the way they can skate and the skill level they have, you know, you're going to, you're going to be put in positions where you're going to take some. So, um, but we're going to just try and stick to a simple game plan and, and, and play a smart hockey game and, and see what happens. I think it's a great challenge, uh, you know, like it is early in the year against any good team. And, you know, we're looking forward to having, you know, that challenge against them. Can you take advantage of maybe being a little older and a little physically more mature against a younger team like that? Well, I, I hope that that plays a, a part of this, you know, certainly, um, you know, again, you know, we've always been a team that needs to work hard uh, to have success as well. Um, you know, we, we not, we're not always blessed with, you know, first round picks like most teams aren't, but uh, we've got enough skill. And I think we've got some, some smart players, like you say, with experience that hopefully will, will benefit us. But uh, you know, it's, it's a game that, you can get into a track meet and get really ugly. <laughs> um, you know, be, you know, they're a team that probably can give up three or four because they have the confidence in their team to score five or six or more. So that that's that you don't see very often, right? You don't see that in college hockey. Uh, you know, not you, you see teams occasionally that have that, and um, but you know, again, we got to play you know to our strengths, which hopefully. Again, you know, playing strong defensively, you know, getting some good goaltending and, and, and being a disciplined team and, and, you know, taking advantage of, you know, our opportunities, but just, you know, not trying to beat ourselves. I, I think that's, we, they've got enough skill and great transition game. We don't need to feed into it. So we've got to, you know, we know they're going to make plays and we know they're a great hockey team, but uh, hopefully our, our older guys, uh, you know, are not really phased by that. Scott, before I let you go, one last question. I know I, I feel like I've asked you this one before, but you, you know, Ed mentioned the returning players you have this year, and it's not always not every school can do that. You 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 guys were able to pull some of those off, but even when you've had some guys that feel like they maybe are borderline NHL ready, they've stayed for that extra year. Why do you why do you feel like guys stay in your program maybe a little longer than some of the other programs out there? I don't know. I guess they enjoy being here. I mean, I think, I think the biggest thing is they enjoy each other's company. I think that's, uh, I've joked with the fifth year guys. I said, you, you really want to put up with me for another, year. well, they laugh with that, but no, our guys really, uh, you know, I know a lot of teams can say this, but the guys really enjoy being around each other and, and, and playing together and, and doing things together. And I think, uh, you know, that that's helped. And, you know, I think we've seen some other guys too, that, you know, have, have stayed and it hasn't hurt them. So I think those are all good examples too, for, for guys, you know, I can use Alex. I follow as a great example, right? He stayed for four years, could have left after a sophomore and junior, but he stayed and stayed with his senior group. And, you know, he's hasn't played a game in the American league and he's, you know, doing great in LA. So there's always examples you can point to. And, and those guys do reach out to if they, you know, if they have questions and, but everybody's situation is different, Jim, as you know, um, you know, organizations are different opportunities, different, but uh, you know, for the most part, I think guys just really enjoy being around each other. Well, I'm sure people will be enjoy being around Amsoil arena this weekend. It will be the icebreaker tournament. I number one, Minnesota state takes on number 10 Providence, number four, Minnesota Duluth against number three, Michigan. This should be some of the best hockey we will see all year. If this was, a frozen four, nobody would be shocked by it. So it's great. It must be great to have that in your hometown, Scotty. Uh, enjoy the weekend and best of luck. Thanks, guys. That's Minnesota Duluth head coach Scott Sandlin. Some great games coming up at the Icebreaker this weekend in Duluth. We'll cover those and other key games in just a moment on the USCHO Game of the Week podcast. This is the USCHO Game of the Week podcast from U.S. College Hockey Online. Continuing now with the Game of the Week podcast, I'm Ed Trefsker alongside Jim Connolly. What a terrific tournament coming up this weekend in the icebreaker out at Minnesota Duluth. One of the games has the number one team in the country, Minnesota State, taking on Providence. That's an interesting matchup because those are two teams from different regions who have both gotten off to great starts. Certainly, you know, in just this entire field, you, you dream of putting a field this strong together for a tournament that is taking place in October because, you know, you, you can only predict where teams will be. And obviously, this was even a tournament that was put together a couple of years ago and then had to be 
postponed last year because of COVID. And, and now they're, they're finally playing. And here we are where all four teams might be better than they were a season ago. So um, that first, first matchup, Minnesota state, obviously Dryden McKay has been strong, but Providence, you know, under Nate Lehman, Providence has been perennially uh, a, a decent team, uh, a frozen four in Boston this year. Maybe they're a little, extra amped up like they were in 2015 when they won their last or their, their only national championship. And I, I think that this is one that you have to be careful if you're Minnesota state and you've had some really tough opponents. We've talked about that in many of our podcasts this week, you know, an absolute murderer's row of opponents, but at the same time, you can't overlook Providence. Uh, they, they are a good team. They're a little younger but they've got some experience in, in the right positions and, and they could be a tough team. And, you know, a, another team that has a couple of good transfers that, you know, can step in and, and will make a difference. Do you think anybody is remembering Minnesota State getting out to an early lead and then Providence coming back to win that regional? I certainly am because I was working that game. It was, uh, I was working in the booth for ESPN and, you know, three nothing. I thought that the game was over. And, you know, and the, the Dunkin' Donuts Center down there in Providence was so deflated. And then all of a sudden, when the power play started happening, boom, one, boom, two, boom, three, you know, and, and next thing you knew, it wasn't just Providence tying the game, but they quickly got a lead and it just never looked back and, you know, never looked back in that regional. They, they handled Cornell the next day uh, handily as well. And, and got to the frozen four, couldn't get a national title, but, you know, still performed, I think a lot better than people thought coming in. So, uh, I think Minnesota state's a little bit of a different team now, you know, they, especially in the NCAA tournament, were lacking a little bit of confidence. If you remember back then hadn't won a game and, you know, even getting out to a three, nothing lead, as soon as you had some adversity, they didn't seem to handle it. Well, I think that a Mike casing squad now is a lot different, than it was maybe back, uh, I guess that's now almost three years ago. And then the other half of that, number three, Michigan at number four, Minnesota Duluth. A real contrast in styles and a contrast in how teams are put together, as we discussed uh, earlier with Scott Sandlin. Uh, all those, you know, seven first round draft picks and some uh, other players that were drafted highly versus a team that may not be exactly the same level of blue chip players, but certainly very talented a little bit older and a little bit mature and running a very disciplined and, and tough and heavy system under Scott Sandlin. Yeah, heavy is a good word. I think that that is what you know, Minnesota Duluth is best known for is that, you know, you're not going to skate easily with the puck and not have some attention paid to you. And, you know, it's maybe it's a little more challenging when you have the speed and skill that Michigan will put forward. But I, I think that Duluth will be up for the, the task of, of that at the same time. You've got to stay emotionally grounded. It's going to be easy in a, in a lively building to maybe lose your composure a little bit, if, you know, and if you you start giving Michigan any power plays whatsoever, uh, this is a power play unit that can move the puck too much talent. Scary. If you're a, a head coach having to look down the, the bench and see, you know, five guys on a first, first unit that all can play in the NHL within the next year. That's that's frightening. So <laughs> I think that, you know, you got to stay within your game. And that's what going to be the biggest challenge for Duluth this entire weekend. Yeah, as they were described, the Harlem Globetrotters of college hockey, that power play unit. Well, some other games going on back east. Number 18 Northeastern is at number six Boston College. Both teams participated in last weekend's icebreaker, but it was scheduled so they wouldn't face each other because they have hockey East games and also the bean pot possibly to face each other. Uh, what do you look for from that? Well, they're, 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 both of these teams, you know, I got to see them last weekend and each had highlights in, in the weekend. BC seemed to get better as the weekend went on. Northeastern actually seemed to take some steps back, regressed a little bit as the weekend went on. Um, Devin Levi is phenomenal in terms of a goaltender. I thought he got a little shaken in the first period last Saturday against Quinnipiac, but I don't expect to see that a lot from him this year. Um, and BC is a little bit of a different team. You know, they've, they lost, you know, through early departure, some really high end talent, but they've got a more experienced blue line. Um, I think Marshall Warren is a guy that is taking a big step forward, jumps into the offensive talking to Jerry York this morning, knows how to play better with the four guys that are on the ice with them. I thought he's, that was a nice compliment for him to pay. Um, but here's an interesting stat. 
going back, I believe it's uh, five seasons. Boston College, it might be six seasons, Boston College against Northeastern. When the games are played at the TD Garden, so that's Bean Pot and Hockey's tournament games, Northeastern is 6-0. and oh. When they are played on campuses, Boston College is 12-2. and two. So Northeastern seems to get up for the big games. BC has been kind of handling Northeastern better in the regular season. So it's interesting to see if that that mentality that Northeastern has when they're in the big games, can they bring that to a Friday night uh, on campus at Boston College? As we head back out to the Midwest, uh, a game that I'm sure Bemidji fans have on their calendar, uh, part of a home-and-home home series, North Dakota at Bemidji and then Bemidji at North Dakota. It was a home-and-home home last weekend for the Beavers versus Minnesota Duluth, and Bemidji was able to keep it pretty close even though they were – outshot handily in both games and they probably are going to face the same thing this weekend. I, I think so. You know, I, I think it'll be a very similar um, circumstance, but they're, you know, maybe they're a little bit more battle tested. The fact that they, they had a really tough series last weekend, but listen, I can't, I can't wake up and ever say that I don't favor North Dakota, <laughs> especially in the home games, but uh, you know, on any of these games, because I, I think that they are the better team. I think that Bemidji State has a lot they want to prove, and they started to do that toward the end of last season, you know, into the NCAA tournament. But um, I think that this is still a series where you have to favor North Dakota. They have the talent. They have the depth. They'll certainly, at least one of the nights, they're going to have a really big crowd of almost 12,000 fans pulling for them. Another game uh, that has non-league implications with two top-ranked teams, both from the state of Minnesota, home and home, Minnesota and St. Cloud. You know, really strong, these two teams. And I'm interested to see, we've, we've kind of seen St. Cloud get their test. Minnesota, I'm really interested to see how good this team is. And a lot of people have higher expectations for Minnesota than they do in the big 10 for Michigan. And I, you know, I think that's a little crazy, but there's people that see a lot more, more big 10 hockey than I do. And that seems they, you know, they seem to be the team that a lot of people believe can be the, the power out of the big 10 this year. It's an experienced team and they've, they, you know, they have a lot of the good pieces to put together, but um, you know, St. Cloud state, we know how, how strong they are. They played a great t road game last Saturday night, bouncing back from a one, nothing loss beating Minnesota state on the road. So I, I kind of look at this game evenly handicapped. I wouldn't say that I, I would put a real favorite in either of these games at all. Um, but it should be two, two really good hockey games. You know, you mentioned the frozen four in Boston and I know they try to, uh, set up brackets so maybe this wouldn't happen, but it would not be too surprising to see Minnesota, St. Cloud, Minnesota Duluth, and Minnesota State all in a frozen four. It's that caliber of play out of all those teams this year. Well, you have that happen, and you might as well just have it in in uh, St. Paul. Just move move the venue because <laughs> it would be a much better be a much better uh, be better tournament for St. Paul than it would be for Boston. But that is that it's quite possible, you know. And, and people have talked about it. it wasn't there? A, was the old tournament the North Star College Cup that they used to have? That was usually an iteration of at least those four teams. Maybe another one that was thrown in to to potentially alternate every year, but. Yeah, I mean, if imagine it does feel like Minnesota teams are as strong as they've ever been, um, and you know, you 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 know, who knows if you get to a Frozen Four with it, but you certainly have the potential that those teams can sit in the top twenty, top fifteen, top ten all all season. And just to be fair, I'll pull four names out of a hat from the East: Quinnipiac, Boston College, uh, UMass, and uh, let's say Northeastern. OK, you could see that, too. Or Providence, you know, so you could you could. Yeah. Yeah. Providence, I think. Yeah, I think that's fair. You know, I, I really liked Quinnipiac seeing them play last weekend. They're a strong team. And, um, you know, I, I think you're right. There, there are there's some balances. You know, I think we all like to see a frozen four where it's, you know, two eastern, two western teams and let the, let the it is if four leagues can be represented. That, that That's one thing that I think is more likely to, to, to have happen than we have in many years. You've had so many of these frozen fours where it's three teams from one league or two teams from one league. This is one of those years where you could have four different leagues easily represented. 
Well, I hope that's the case. We got one more game to touch on. Earlier this week on the Spotlight podcast, we had a great conversation with Michigan Tech head coach Joe Sean. They have a Saturday game that's against the U.S. National Development Team, but a Friday single game, uh, number 16 Michigan Tech hosting number 17 Notre Dame. I think that Notre Dame's in for a big test, to be honest with you, going up to Houghton and trying to to get a win up there. I mean, that's that's going to be a very tough test for them. And they, uh, you know, I, I know that Notre Dame has high expectations. They do every year. But I honestly think that if you have a team that's going to come into that that game with more confidence, it's undoubtedly Michigan Tech. Well, that's some, uh, some of the big games going on this weekend. Hopefully you get to catch some either live or or on TV, a lot of opportunities for streaming and uh, network video coming up this weekend. For Jim Connolly, I'm Ed Trefsker, and we'll catch you next time. This has been the USCHO Game of the Week podcast, a production of U.S. College Hockey Online. Visit uschocom slash podcasts to listen or subscribe.